So I'm going to kick off our next session on the status of interventional EUS. And I'm going to focus on these four topics, celiac block and neurolysis, oncotherapy, vascular therapy, and transluminal drainage. An important objective is that we appreciate the pitfalls of anecdotal case reports and the need for evidence-based practice. So let's start with celiac block and neurolysis. Now the two terms, block and neurolysis, are often used interchangeably, but they're different. Block is when we inject an anesthetic followed by a steroid, and the goal here is to disrupt the pain pathway. It's a temporary uh, treatment. Neurolysis, on the other hand, we use ethanol, we use a sclerosant, and the goal is to uh, uh, to permanently destroy the nerve pathway, the pain pathway. We have three injection techniques. We have the single or central injection. We have bilateral injection on both the, light, the left and the right sides of the aorta. And then we have sil uh, selective ganglioglysis. So you can see here the central and then the bilateral with the blue arrows. And here you can see a ganglia and we're targeting that with our needle. So when we perform block, we're targeting the plexus, so we call that celiac plexus block, or CPB. This is widely practiced, but the benefit for pancreatitis pain has remained unproven, and we know it's very short-lived. There is a randomized controlled trial that compared anesthetic alone versus anesthetic plus a steroid, and this study showed, uh, RCT, that the steroid added no benefit. And in fact, in both treatment groups, the response rate was only 15%. And that led to an editorial um, that accompanied this paper by Mel Wilcox. And he asked, isn't it time to abandon celiac plexus blockade for the treatment of abdominal pain in chronic pancreatitis? And that's six years ago, and we're still performing CPB. Well, the good news, is that we have two randomized controlled trials that are pending. And the first is EUS with CPB versus EUS and a sham treatment. That's from the University of Alabama. And the second is EUS plus minus CPB from USC. So we anxiously await those trials so that hopefully we'll have a final verdict whether we should be performing CPB. What about celiac plexus neurolysis? Should we perform the central or the bilateral injection? One or two injections? Well, this is a study from 2009, prospective, but none randomized. And that study showed that, in fact, the bilateral injection was significantly better than the single injection. And so based on that, I actually stopped doing single and I went to bilateral injection. A few years later, 2011, a randomized controlled trial was published, and this study showed that, in fact, both central and bilateral were equivalent. There was no difference in the pain relief and no difference in the onset or duration. There was no difference in the safety or the survival. And the response rate was between 70 and 80 percent um, uh, in the two groups. So based on that, I switched my practice back to doing just one injection. What about ganglioglysis? Should we target the ganglia? As you can see here in this video, you can see that these ganglia are identified as sesame seed or almond-shaped structures. We target them and we inject ethanol into the ganglia. Should we do that or should we perform plexus neurolysis? There was a retrospective study that found that when you targeted the ganglia, when you could see them, so they could only be visualized in about two-thirds of the cases, but when you saw them, you would have a significantly higher response rate compared to when you did celiac plexus neurolysis, a 15-fold increased response rate. So this suggests that we should perform ganglioglysis. Later, we have this randomized controlled trial from Japan, 13 centers comparing CGN with CPN. And this showed that CGN, ganglioglysis, was significantly superior to CPN. And based on this, our practice really should shift to performing ganglioglysis first. 
and we should only do CPN if we cannot visualize the ganglia. Well, the, everything was turned upside down at this year's DDW when Michael Levy presented this abstract, and it's now in, in press, um, and uh, it is titled Com Combined Celiac Ganglia and Plexus Neurolysis Shortens Survival Without Benefit Versus Plexus Neurolysis Alone. This basically reverses everything. In this randomized controlled trial that was double blind in 110 patients, pain control in both groups was the same. Adverse events were the same. And in fact, in the CGN group, the gangliolysis, there was one patient that developed paralysis due to spinal cord compression. Importantly though, the survival of patients was significantly worse in those patients that underwent CGN. And this led Michael Levy to conclude the role of CGN must be reassessed. So we clearly need to wait for more data. All right, now let's turn to oncotherapy. Now, over the past couple of decades, we've seen many, many case reports, even some series that have reported on different modalities for oncotherapy using injection techniques or thermal ablation techniques. We've borrowed these for the most part from our interventional radiologists. All of them are very exciting. They range from the very simple, doing sclerotherapy with ethanol, for example, to the more complex, using immunotherapy. Ken Chang pioneered this early on. Even the futuristic gene therapy and all of these different thermal ablative modalities, all extremely sexy. However, they all still remain experimental, and there's been no proven survival advantage. Now, where we clearly would like to see some guidance is whether we should be treating these pancreatic cysts that we suspect to be mucinous cysts. The 2018 guidelines, however, and these are two from Europe and from the United States, state first, that further studies are required and second, it should not be performed outside of clinical trials. So this is definitely not ready for prime time. We're gonna see this today, for example, and in our live courses, but this is not ready for prime time. What about pancreatic cyst ablation? I just wanna make you aware of the CHARM study that was published last year. And in this study, they randomized patients to chemotherapy with and without ethanol. We used to think that to, uh, uh, to achieve ablation, we need to use um, ethanol or sclerosant. However, in this study, ethanol added no benefit over chemotherapy, chemotherapy alone. They used paclitaxel and gemcitabine. And in both groups, they had a two-third cyst resolution effect, 67% without and 61% with alcohol. There was no adverse effects in the chemotherapy group versus acute pancreatitis in the ethanol group. So we have evolved from using ethanol to combining ethanol with chemotherapy to now probably we're just going to use chemotherapy to maximize the therapeutic effect while minimizing the side effects. All right, let's switch to vascular therapy. Has great conceptual appeal for us because we can visualize the needle tip in the vessel. On ultrasound, we can confirm blood flow with Doppler. We can confirm vessel obliteration when in the absence of Doppler flow. And of course, we can perform this independent of our endoscopic visualization. We don't even have to see endoscopically. The stomach can be filled with blood or food, whatever. Potential applications are hemostasis. We can use a sclerosant or glue or coil. And our targets may be varices, AVMs, aneurysms. I'm sorry, let's go back one. Aneurysms, ulcers, tumors. There have been many, many case reports on vascular therapy. What's very exciting though is portal angiotherapy. therapy. Now I've had personal interest in the use of coil combined with glue for treatment of large gastric fundal uh, varices. The coil fills and reduces flow in the varix and the coil serves as a scaffold to retain glue at the site of, uh, of injection. And the purpose here is to avoid embolization. However, we clearly need randomized controlled trials comparing endoscopic glue injection versus EUS glue injection and EUS glue versus EUS guided coil plus glue. 
Portal Angel Therapy, this is a very exciting area because with EOS, we can directly access the portal vein, which cannot be accessed through a peripheral vein. There are many potential applications here. I'm going to highlight a couple here. Firstly, direct portal pressure gradient measurement. Ken Chang has done work on this in patients. This is a study that was published showing great success rates with no adverse events. It's extremely simple. We uh, target the hepatic vein, we pull back and target the portal vein, we measure the pressures in each, and then we measure the pressure uh, gradient. One could also theoretically perform an EUS guided tips because it's simply an extension of this basic technique. And this has been uh, reported also using lumen opposing metal stents. It's the portal injection chemotherapy that I think is the most exciting because we can optimize liver levels and minimize systemic levels of chemotherapy. Here in this animal study, uh, it was shown that we could significantly increase the levels of paclitaxel, doxyrubicin, and renotecan in the hepatic, uh, the hepatic vein levels versus the systemic uh, levels. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the details of this. We await human uh, studies for this. The last topic I'm going to touch on very quickly is transluminal drainage. We've borrowed this from our interventional radiologists, the Seldinger technique. You're all familiar with this. However, there's a big difference between what the radiologists do and what we do. We, per, we create an intentional perforation of the bowel wall. And when you get contamination outside the bowel wall due to leakage, the consequences can be disastrous. So what we need are EUS dedicated devices and methods to prevent that leakage. And the two approaches that I've been working on are the development of transluminal delivery systems that allow us to deploy our stent without any over-the-guide wire exchange. In other words, we want to do it with a non soldinger technique. And secondly, to use a transluminal stent designed for connecting two lumens, a lumen-opposing stent that also could be used as a port for transluminal intervention. And that's uh, what, what I've been working on over the past uh, decade. You're familiar with the lumen-opposing metal stents, and we've seen a number of reports on transluminal drainage of pretty much any structure uh, outside of the gastrointestinal tract that we can target, pancreatic fluid collections, gallbladder, bile ducts, and even uh, uh, draining the stomach through a gastrojejunostomy. Interestingly, we're now seeing the creation of enteric anastomoses with the so-called EDGE procedure where we create a gastrogastrostomy for ERCP post-bypass. And finally, we're actually ironically seeing off-label use of the LAMs developed for transluminal drainage, but now used for luminal applications for pyloric strictures and short uh, anastomotic strictures. So these are all feasible and safe in these case series, but what still remains to be answered is in whom and when. It's not just about safety, though, and feasibility. It's about creating a port for direct transluminal intervention. In other words, we want to extend our reach as interventional endoscopist to structures outside of the gastrointestinal tract. And so, for example, you can see how we can go in the gallbladder and perform all of these different interventions. What is the future? It's expanding our reach because the GI tract is a window to all major organs. I think the only one I have enlisted here is the brain. But if you think of the, the oral cavity as being part of the digestive uh, tract, which it is because we produce amylase in our saliva, then maybe we can even access the brain. Thank you very much.